And welcome back once again to Capital Tonight. My next guest has been lauded by many as being one of the individuals on the forefront of reforming the education system. Her network of charter schools in high poverty areas of New York City has been used as a model that is heavily based on literacy and writing, while also integrating arts and sports at a time when many districts are scaling back. Students in these schools have been performing very well of late, which has some people wondering if this model will work beyond the targeted demographic of the inner city. She has even co-authored a book that makes exactly that case. Her name is Eva Moskowitz. She's a former New York City Council member and founder and CEO of the Success Academy Charter Schools. And she is joining me from our studios in New York this evening, New York City. Thank you very much for being here, Eva. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Liz. So uh, the name of the book, which um, is out now, it, you've co-authored, it's called Mission Possible. And the subtitle, I think, is very interesting, How the Secrets of the Success Academies Can Work in Any School. When you say any school, do you mean public schools and charter schools? Is that your intention? Well, of course, charter schools are public schools, but right. I mean literally any school, uh, district, parochial, independent, charter, uh, any school, and uh, these are solutions that really uh, were oriented towards ones that don't require new money and political will and major transformations. This is uh, how to play the hand you're dealt and make sure that kids get what they deserve. Well, it, it does. It's true that it, it might not require more money, but it would require an entire sort of transformation of thinking. For example, one of the things you promote is to stop talking down to kids and to uh, raise the bar high. Your, the word specifically is rigor. Rigor, 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 to expect that the kids can perform at a level higher than even maybe they believe or the teacher might well believe that can be achieved. And that, that requires, that's a, that's a radical transformation, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't say it wasn't going to require radical change on the part of adults. I simply said it wasn't going to require radical change on the part of politicians. Got uh, it. This is just, um, this is about uh, a paradigm shift uh, on the part of the adults. Uh, I believe that one of the sins of American public education, and it's not just a sin that is committed against the most disadvantaged children, it's actually in the suburbs, uh, among affluent children, all across America, we underestimate children intellectually. We think because they are short, somehow they are stupid. And we don't believe that at Success Academies. We think kids are unbelievably smart, their minds are incredibly agile, and we are boring them to tears. And one of the easiest, cheapest, fastest ways to improve American public education is simply to up our intellectual ante on the part of the adults. So for a traditional public school, and, and I was indeed remiss by not, making this, by not making this distinction, charter schools are in fact publicly funded. They're a little bit outside some of the um, strict requirements, right? which is part of the reason why uh, proponents say they're so successful, because they are not unionized, which is part of, uh, not all of them, some of them are, I should say. But in order to have this dramatic paradigm shift, within the confines of a unionized public traditional education system. Is that possible, do you believe? Would that need to be negotiated? And uh, would the unions even go for it? Well, this is not something that I would run by the unions. If you are an individual teacher or you are an individual principal, I would strongly recommend that you up your intellectual expectations uh, for the children. And I don't think you need to ask anyone's permission to do that, but you need to start um, pitching higher and testing your kids' ceilings. And I, uh, I would venture to wage that they will meet your expectations. Not day one, not necessarily day two, uh, but if you keep at it, you keep expecting a lot intellectually from your children, they will get there. It, you've actually written that um, about the, the quote monopoly of district public education and that charters that, that never put the customer first and never find ways to boost productivity and innovate and that charters exist in part because they will spur the public, the traditional public schools to do better. Now, 
That's been an argument that's been made almost since we started talking about charter schools in this state, which is, of course is very controversial. But if you look at the test results, it hasn't really, well, particularly in New York City, it hasn't really turned out that way. Well, I think um, uh, the argument is a little more complex than that. The promise of the public charter movement was twofold. Uh, first, that competition would uh, result in changes to the uh, monopoly of public education, and two, that charters would innovate and through their innovations uh, be able to uh, play a role in bettering all schools. And I would argue, by the way, that this book is part of that. So we innovated at Success Academies. We're not just interested in the children who are educated within our four walls. We are interested in changing the life trajectories for all children. And so this book is a, an attempt to share those best practices. We're humble about it. We don't have all the answers. We think we have a piece of the puzzle, and we wanted others to have access to that. Uh, in terms of the competition, I've always believed that um, you've got to get a lot of charters, and you've got to get to a critical mass. Uh, the monopoly is very tough to influence. It doesn't do it because one school is in its backyard. It takes a lot of schools, um, you know, and it takes parents voting with their feet. And you already see that in Harlem. Uh, Harlem is, in essence, a parent choice zone uh, where a very high percentage of parents uh, have decided that when they're offered a choice between a charter school and a district school, uh, the charter schools uh, are a better option. But we ourselves had 13,000 parents apply uh, to go to our schools for 1,200 spots. Okay, but what about for the rest of the state? I mean, uh, for example, you know, I looked at the, at the charter school test results compared to the traditional public school test results, and in many instances in your schools, for example, the kids performed better on the whole. But there are a number of schools, particularly upstate, I looked at schools in Albany, in Rochester, in Syracuse, where some of the performance is really fairly dismal, like 46% worse than the public education system. I mean, that doesn't seem to be too promising for the charter movement. Well, I, here's the way I look at it. I don't think that charter guarantees uh, excellence. What charters do is they give you the freedom to be excellent, which is very different than being excellent. The problem with the district schools is that it is incredibly difficult to be excellent. Uh, the principles are so constrained between the bureaucracy of management on the one hand and the labor contracts on the other. It is an absolute miracle if kids are getting what they need and deserve. Uh, whereas charter schools freeze you from some of that, but you can still not be excellent. And so what we need to do is we need to take uh, the excellent charter schools and try and support and grow and encourage people to come to New York City or come around the state who have educational ideas and are talented at the operational aspects of schooling, and we need to support them and grow while simultaneously making policy reforms that are gonna allow the districts uh, to be profoundly more excellent than they are. Do you see a role for traditional district public schools? I mean, your vision, I know that you're growing. At one point, it was, it was you estimated you'd like to have 40 schools. Now it's open-ended. You've got um, schools opening in fairly affluent communities in Brooklyn, the Upper West Side. But traditional district public schools, would you like to see them eradicated? No, I, I, I just think they need to get into the, 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 the the current century, um, the antiquated, ossified ways of uh, operating, whether it be educationally, operationally, financially, this is a way of the past. And we are in the future. And by the way, we are in a, a global competitive situation where um, this mode of district operation of school, the monopoly of public education, uh, it's not going to last whether we like it or not. It's not a question of whether you're a reformer or not. It is an unsustainable system economically, educationally, politically. And so we have two choices. We can get in front of that and we can do fundamental reform 
or we can have China and India eat our lunch. Those are really the choices. And um, I'm hoping that we as a city and a state and a country can move fast enough uh, to reinvent American public education. Um, this, this whole model is not cheap, if I'm not mistaken. There was just recently an approval to have tuition at your schools increased to $2,000 a year, is that right? No, 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 no. There's no tuition. That, that's a complete misunderstanding. Sorry. I'm sorry. These sorry. are free public schools. There's utterly no tuition. We educate kids on significantly less money than the district. Um, and we get vastly uh, a better results. I think what you're referring to the per is, pupil uh, fee. Um, Forgive me. Forgive no, it's me. not a per pupil. It's not a per pupil fee. It has nothing to do with the per pupil. We're not getting more money from the state. Uh, it costs parents absolutely uh, nothing to attend our schools. Uh, this is about what's called a management fee, hmm. uh, and there was a change in the management fee, it was at about 10%, which means the, the schools uh, uh, pay a fee. It, money was moving from one not-for-profit entity to another not-for-profit entity so that we could better serve teachers, principals, and kids. And it has been profoundly misrepresented in the media. And it's important to me that uh, it is uh, accurately described. Okay, well, we've set that straight. Uh, if you, before I let you go, I want to ask: Are do you have any plans to expand beyond the confines of the five boroughs? Um, I hope that New York City remains a hospitable place uh, for um, you know educators who want to serve the children of this city because god knows uh, we need as many people as we can uh, to do that kind of work but i think it's an open question whether the next mayor will create a hospitable environment and we can only open schools and run great schools if we have a mayor who is willing to support uh, change a bold fast change and so i'm waiting to see if the mayoral candidates are really going to come out with an education platform. They've told us what they don't like about Bloomberg, uh, and I think the mayor has done some really good work, but they haven't told us what they're for. They're very big on what they're against, and I'm still waiting to hear what they're for. Hmm. Well, so are we, and of course, we're going to be keeping an eye on it. You've been mentioned as a potential future mayoral candidate yourself, so we'll be staying in touch with you. I'm